As I promised in our Chapter 17 video lecture, today I'll be teaching you about the reactions of aldehydes and ketones. My personal affinity for aldehydes goes back to my days in high school, when I first visited Utah State University's cadaver lab while taking a human anatomy class. It was creepy. I couldn't help but notice the unusual smell of the preserving agents they used in the cadaver lab. Though it caused many of my classmates to faint and vomit with disgust, I actually liked it. Why? Because it smelled just like the paste I ate in school when I was in kindergarten. What was causing that smell? While more modern preserving agents were probably used in that cadaver lab, a part of that smell came from formaldehyde, which is the most structurally simple aldehyde. I should state for the record that I doubt the paste I was eating in kindergarten contained formaldehyde. I just know that it contained something that smelled and tasted very similar to the preserving agents used in our wretched cadaver lab. Here's a list of the things I expect you to be able to do after studying this chapter. As I usually do, I'm not going to read it to you now. Instead, I'll let you pause the video and read it for yourself if you wish. I'll begin by teaching you how to produce systematic IUPAC names for aldehydes and ketones. This will probably feel very comfortable if you properly studied the IUPAC naming of carboxylic acid derivatives back in chapter 17. If, however, you put off watching those lecture videos until the night before you were supposed to, and only watch them while half asleep wearing a Snuggie and drinking warm Mountain Dew, then I have to say to you, shame on you. This might, in that case, seem somewhat bewildering. First of all, to systematically name an aldehyde or a ketone, you have to find the parent chain, which is the longest carbon chain that contains the aldehyde or ketone. Then you number the carbon atoms in the chain in the direction that gives the smallest number to the aldehyde or ketone carbon. Then we write the full name as a single word. Substituents, of course, always go first. And then they are followed by the parent chain in which we've replaced the E in the typical alkane name with the suffix al, A-L, for an aldehyde, or with the suffix own for a ketone. We then, of course, list the substituents in alphabetical order using the prefixes di, tri, etc. if the same substituent is present multiple times in the molecule. Here are some examples. In this example, you'll notice that we have a two-carbon long aldehyde. Two-carbon long uh, chain in IUPAC nomenclature is called ethane. Because this is an aldehyde, though, we replace the letter E at the end of the name ethane with the suffix al. So this compound becomes ethanol. This compound, following IUPAC nomenclature, is a propane. But it's an aldehyde, so we call it propanal. Now we don't have to assign numbers to aldehydes because it is assumed that the aldehyde carbon is carbon number one. Over here we have a slightly more complex aldehyde. It's five carbons long, which is a pentane, but we replace the letter E with the suffix al, so it becomes pentanal. You'll notice that on the two carbon there's an ethyl substituent, and on the four carbon there's a methyl substituent. We place those substituent names at the beginning alphabetically. Thus, the name for this compound is 2-ethyl-4-methyl-pentanal. Here's some examples of ketone names. You'll notice that the longest carbon chain here is a three carbon long chain, which is called propane. Because this is a ketone, we replace the letter E in propane with the suffix own, so it becomes propanone. We usually have to ascribe a l number at the beginning of the name to denote which carbon in the chain the ketone is on. For propanone, however, this is the simplest ketone. We don't have to put a number because there's only one possible carbon a ketone can be on in a three carbon long chain. For this example, which is six carbons long, the parent name would be hexane. Because it is a ketone, we replace the letter E with the suffix own. It thus becomes 3-hexanone. In order to indicate which 
carbon in this chain has the carbonyl, or the double bond of the oxygen, we have to put the number 3 in front of it, thus distinguishing 3-hexanone from 2-hexanone, or 4-hexanone. In this example, we have a 7-carbon long chain, which would be called a heptane. It is a ketone, though, so we replace the letter E in heptane with the suffix own. It therefore becomes heptanone, and we use the number 2 to indicate that the ketone is located on carbon number 2. You'll notice that in this compound, on carbon number 6, there is a methyl substituent. It therefore becomes 6-methyl-2-heptanone. Now, if you have a cyclic ketone, we always assume that the carbonyl position is position number 1. This is exemplified here in cyclohexanone. We don't have to put a number because it is assumed that the carbonyl is at position number 1. Here are some other interesting compounds that have more than one ketone in them. For uh, compounds that have more than one ketone, we call them dions. This compound would systematically be named a butane dione. We don't have to it, ascribe any numbers to it because the only type of dion that we can have would, uh, for butane would be a butane dion with the carbonyls at positions 2 and 3. Here we could potentially have 2, 3, or 2, 4 carbonyls, thus to in differentiate between the two we have to put the numbers. This compound is called 2,4-pentane dione. This is an interesting compound because it has both an alkene and a ketone in it. Thus the parent name of this chain, because it's an alkene, would be hexene. You'll notice, however, that the carbonyl takes precedent in the numbering. Thus, we have to number in the direction that gives the ketone carbonyl the lowest number. So we start numbering from right to left. Position 1, 2, where the carbonyl is, 3, and 4. 4 is where the double bond begins in this hexene. The name, therefore, becomes 4-hexen to own. As we already discussed in chapter 17, carboxylic acid derivatives react according to the diagram shown here. You'll remember that a nucleophile, shown here by Z minus, comes in and attacks the carbonyl carbon and thrusts these electrons up onto the oxygen to give us this tetrahedral intermediate. The O minus charge then comes back down and kicks off our leaving group Y to give us this kind of product. This mechanism was repeated so many times during our Chapter 17 video lectures that you may have felt sorely tempted to stab your eyes out from boredom. My response to this kind of behavior is that first, it is not appropriate. And second, you need to develop a higher tolerance for boredom. Aldehydes and ketones are different from other carboxylic acid derivatives that we discussed because they have a hydrogen or a carbon attached to the carbonyl position. Because hydrogens and carbon chains are not good leaving groups, when this Z- minus comes in and this tetrahedral intermediate is formed, this O- minus charge cannot close down and kick off a hydrogen or a carbon because you'd be kicking off an H- minus or a C minus, which would be very, very unstable. Instead, the negatively charged oxygen lingers until it is protonated during an acid quench. Wouldn't we all like to get protonated during an acid quench, metaphorically speaking? <laughs>